This show is brought to you by our generous patrons at patreon.com slash falloutlorecast. Robots Radio presents the Fallout Lorecast. Welcome to the Fallout Lorecast, a place for the Fallout community to come together to explore the boundaries of our knowledge about the world of Fallout. It's that time again, friends. It is Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, and we are here with the Fallout Lorecast. I'm your host, Tom, or Robots, and I'm here with my co-host, Lainey, or Neos Pandora. Lainey, how are you doing? Happy Monday. I'm doing pretty good. I uh, Sorry if I sound a little stuffy. I promise I'm not sick. I don't have COVID. I just have allergies. (laughs) Yeah, and cat ears. I like your cat ears. ears. They've returned. Awesome. Well, I'm I'm sorry you're having to deal with uh, allergies and uh, you know uh, you moved into a uh, a room that I as we were talking before the show started hasn't been cleaned in like uh, uh, 300 years. So yeah. it's the oldest room in the United States. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> thanks thanks for being here. And as uh, usual, we have a, a very interesting topic this week. We started out this year talking about uh, some of the lore from Fallout 76, which is the newest game in the Fallout series, and I've been waiting to to dive into Fallout 76 because it is kind of one of those newer things, but it's been out for over two years now and they're adding more to it. So it seemed like it was the right time for us to really start talking about some of these topics. And last week we talked about Vault 76's Overseer because that's the vault you come from in the game. And one of the first groups that you run into, or at least you learn about, even in the original release before they upgraded the game and added more NPCs and stories and those kinds of things were the responders or at least what seems to be left of the responders. So that will be our topic for today. And Lainey, of course, as as usual, has put together a wonderful presentation on this and I'll be chiming in as we go. So Lainey, why don't don't we just go ahead and kick this off? All righty. So I guess we'll start from the beginning. After the Great War, a group called the Responders was founded by uh, four members of what were already, um, what would you call them? Uh, Organizations. First, like, first response workers. workers. Yeah, 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 yeah. First response yeah. workers. So you yeah. have like police officers and firefighters and so on. Um, so we have uh, Maria Chavez, Jeff Nakamura, Melody Larkin, and Sanjay Kumar, who started acting in the role as essentially a local government for Appalachia after... Uh, the bombs dropped and their job was to provide disaster relief to anyone who had either survived the bombs or was being born now that the bombs had gone off. Right. And um, and let's I want to paint the picture a little bit here. Like we have the most tragic events in the history of the United States and the history of the world happening. You have n- a nuclear Armageddon. Right. Um, that is <laughs> that is a. A, a terrible, terrible, terrible situation. And we have seen terrible situations in our lifetime. And, and this last year has been rough. And uh, it, I just wanted to call this out at the beginning. Thank you to our first responders. Thank you to the uh, people who work in the health services and safety services and those kinds of things, because they genuinely are heroes. And in this situation, it's it's um, I, I don't know. It's it's interesting to me that this was written a number of years ago because it is a situation where the world needs that their help and this group steps up and having talked with some of the the people behind these games they spend a lot of time thinking through this like if this were to actually happen and you ended up in a place like Appalachia that didn't get hit nearly as bad as many other locations what would happen and I think they're right. I think that the first responders, the people with medical training, the, the police officers, the firefighters, many of those people are exactly the people that everyone else would be going to for help. And those are the people who would know what to do and how to respond and how to organize. And that's exactly what happened here is that these different groups came together and they provided aid to the people in need. Right. Um, They also provided survival training. Anyone could go through the automated system um, to learn how to survive in the wasteland from what they were learning, which is really awesome. So they basically turned Appalachia into a space where people could keep surviving um, and they didn't have to be alone. Unfortunately, 
not everyone was on the same side as them. Um, right, right. And one of the one of the themes I want to point out here is we learned in the last episode about the overseer from Vault 76, what she discovered about what happened with these groups and the reason why they fell apart. And we're going to get a little bit more into that with this episode in that not everybody was on the same page. There was a lot of disagreement. There were a lot of people who were working against each other, even though they all had good intentions. They were working against each other. And I think that is the that is the greater tragedy here. Right, right. And well, in the last one, the overseer says that that's exactly why she thinks they failed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So the responders were uh, essentially the leaders in these post-war restorations, and their efforts were focused in the capital of West Virginia, Charleston, West Virginia. Um, and they turned it into a space where anyone could go to get help or request help. Um, and because of that, it became, uh, it was becoming restored in a faster fashion than the rest of the wasteland was at this point, because that's where the people were, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so they were creating a real community there again. Unfortunately, the demand for aid outweighed what they were able to supply, leading the responders to limit their ability to give aid to anything they could address immediately. So if what they needed to do was something that they didn't have their they didn't have their hands on enough materials, or if they had to go out and go somewhere, like they had to go on some sort of journey, it was out of the cards. They couldn't do it anymore unless right. they could address it right then and there. It was no longer an option. And we've and we've seen a lot of it, of this kind of decision making happening in just the last year with the things that we've been dealing with. You know, like uh, the people who need help right now are the ones who get it. And it's hard to do any long term planning or reach out beyond the people who are immediately there in need in the moment. So it is unfortunate they couldn't do as much as they had wanted to. Right, because they definitely did want to, uh, but they, they were unable to. Uh, this unfortunately led to some survivors being totally neglected um and we see this in pleasant valley in the pleasant valley ski resort where uh there were settlers or i guess they're not settlers what else would you call them if they just survived other than survivors, survivers? <laughs> yeah i'm just yeah, I was trying to think of like um, another word um but yeah there are people there that were trying to make do and couldn't <laughs> um and decided to kind of you know, look for someone within their ranks to rally with and like help carry them. And they found David Thorpe, who uh, in the descriptions that I read of him was described as being like stone cold, like mm -hmm. just just one one hell of a guy, you know, <laughs> one probably not hell really of lovely a guy. to like. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not really that great to be around. It's unfortunate um, that oftentimes the leaders that we flock to are the ones who appear to be good leaders because they're, you know, they're, they have measured responses or they look like they're not as stressed by the situation. But oftentimes that means that they're also not as, I don't know, empathetic with <laughs> the situation right. as it's going. <laughs> um, and yeah, and we'll see where this leads. So, well, so yeah, so David Thorpe eventually turns the people trying to live in the ski resort into one of the most fearsome raider groups in Appalachia. Um, and so, uh, in 2082, the responders took down a different raider group, uh, led by a woman named Ro Rosalind or Rosalind Jeffries, mm -hmm. who they captured, assuming that they could kind of ransom her with other raiders, um, and attempt an attempt to get peace <laughs> from the raiders to make sure that like, okay, we'll give you her back and you guys won't mess with us and we can do what we want to do and like help people, you know, um, without the raiders attacking their outposts and such. Right. This right. It was almost a, sh a show of power. It was a, it was a like, right. Hey, listen, don't mess with us. Let's just agree to stay apart. Like, let's just agree to like, here's the boundary. We'll make an agreement. You stay over there. We'll stay over here. You don't want to mess with yeah. us because we're capable, but let us just do our thing. But unfortunately that did not go as planned. And I guess word didn't get out that they didn't actually kill her they just kind of kidnapped her and good old david thorpe was very angry and went after them and uh decided that the best course of action was to on christmas day christmas yes. morning right right to take mini nukes and blow up the summersville dam 
Right. So, <laughs> so, so this is, I mean, this is absolutely uh, horrific, like to specifically like this is the kind of thing the Joker does in order to get back at Batman and Gotham City. You know, like this is the, you know, like, let's pick a day that is sacred or, you know, to, to many people or just a day that most people associate with happiness uh, five years after the most tragic event of their lives. And let's create mass destruction. It. And and it's all because he was still bitter that the the responders didn't come help them out. Right, right. So he uh, he floods them. What happens is they're sitting, uh, what beneath you know. If you're okay, we all know how water works. It goes down. If you're on a lower level of land, <laughs> the water is, it will flood. Yeah, right. <laughs> and unfortunately, all of the land that the responders were using flooded. Right. So and Charles you can see the, the results of this in the game. Like you can see the blown up dam. You can see uh, like there's large swaths of of what used to like if you come at it from certain angles, it looks like it, it was a dried up lake bed or something. But that's that is the result of the flood that was caused by the dam exploding. Right. And it uh, it was really devastating for the responders because it not only destroyed some of their supplies and their homes themselves, but it killed a lot of their the responders themselves and their families. Um, so yeah, so this is, re- this is regarded as the Christmas flood. Mm-hmm. Uh, if anyone's curious, that's, if that's, if you ever hear that in the fallout community, that's what that means. Um, and it was a really hard time for the responders, but this is not where they f- ended. <laughs> they actually ended up thriving after this. It kind of led way to a lot of growth for them. So they, despite suffering through it, ended up resettling at the Morgantown airport where they uh, got to expand into the Flatwoods and some areas also around. This was a really good place for them because it was central to the Raiders that they were interacting with and uh, the Brotherhood of Steel at the time while they were there Mm -hmm. and um, the Free States and just it was a really good central location for them to access people. Um, Right. And uh, to jump in again, if um if you play through the story progression or the original story progression where you go find uh, the remnants of the responders and you follow them through the the quest chain that it takes you on, it actually takes you to many of these locations in order. Um, mm-hmm. and, you, and you sort of live through without even really realizing it at the time, you sort of live through the process that they went through in settling and starting in one place and then moving to another. So when you do end up at the Morgantown Airport, surrounded by scorched and all the other things that are going there that's that is that phase of this uh development in i guess right. their organization right so when they get there it's relatively peaceful and they um are able to create like a proper organization uh something that was a problem for them when they first started out was that there was no actual like ranks in their organization they were all operating underneath like the kinds of ranks and leadership that you would have within their individual organizations so like firefighters acted like firefighters and police officers acted like police officers but they're supposed to work together right Mm -hmm. right and so that didn't work out um and that caused a lot of problems with like decision making and like who does what um so at this point now that they're starting fresh they put maria chavez who was one of the founders in a leadership position so she was in charge and then um there are four ranks now underneath and so the the actual organization um of the responders is as follows you have at the top the senior responders these are the leaders uh, maria chavez is the highest one um these are also typically of course the most experienced member members lots of these people have been there from the beginning right then and probably had uh, probably had leadership roles before the the war happened had probably, right, right. you know, experienced uh, or were more experienced and had, you know, run the organizations that they were originally a part of. Yeah, a lot of these people are carrying over. I mean, most of them are carrying over jobs that they already had. Um, although, of course, some of them have joined since, you know, the bomb drop. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then you get responders who are they're fully trained and they're given specialized assignments and they're provided housing. Um, this includes things like the fire breathers, which uh, Which is a great name. That's so, such a good name. <laughs> they're pretty cool. We'll talk about them more in a little bit. Um, also, the Flatwoods paramedics, which are paramedics, and the responders police force, which had its own. Um, there was like a separate police force that was in Charleston than there was in uh, Morgantown. 
mm-hmm. just because of the tragedy that occurred there. Um, but yeah, so those are the the main three kind of sects of the organization. And then below that, you have volunteers, who is anyone who's made it through the automated training. You in the game are going to become a volunteer if you play through that storyline. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have volunteer candidates, which is not only anyone actively going through the training, but also anyone who uh, is too young to become a volunteer yet. So maybe they've gone through the training, but they're just not old enough. Or if they were like born into it, they're like uh, junior volunteers. They're, yeah. They, yeah, they don't have full status until they reach a certain age. Right, right. So yeah, so that's what they came up with, and uh, it's much more organized than everyone just trying their best. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so by 2086, they were the strongest they'd ever been. Um, and at this point they were not only thriving on their own, but they were working alongside the Brotherhood of Steel and the Free States, Mm -hmm. um, which is awesome. And they were able to do this because they had a lot of supplies in this new location. They had access to much more land to farm things. They had access to more people. So they were great to trade with. And of course, the Brotherhood saw that. The Free State saw that. Yeah. Um, so this is where it ends, right? Like, th- this is great. Like, everything's going well. They've bounced back from the tragedy of the Christmas flood. And I mean, just like any of these fallout stories, it ends up good and happy, right? Oh, of course not. Um, <laughs> of course so... <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> so you see here, uh, it does sound dandy, right? So they have the Brotherhood to help them fight things. <laughs> Sounds dandy. If they wanted to. Um, everything is great, except there's someone that everyone kind of uh, either didn't know about or forgot about, depending on if we're talking about the player or the people in the game. Yeah, I think... Um, I think the, the Enclave exists. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't... I don't think the responders had any real sense of who the Enclave was. Yeah, at this I don't point. think so either. I don't think they had um, any idea. And Probably lots of players, if you, you know, depending on what fall games you have or haven't played, you might not know much about the Enclave either. Right. Um, yeah. Which, so this would be, this is really just like these people came, this, the boogeyman came out and caused chaos, essentially. Um, but the Enclave came out of hiding and was like, ha ha, we've been doing some tests. Here's some Scorch Beasts. And then just <laughs> let them deal with it. Here's, have, <laughs> have some Scorch, have some Scorched. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> Yeah. So, so this marks the beginning of the scorched plague. This is where right. it all begins. Right. Right. From so, this point prior, uh, there was no scorched. Right. Yes. Um. So, that's absolutely a wonderful place for us to pause and do the middle of the show, <laughs> and come back and talk about the scorch. Because anybody who's played Fallout seventy six knows about the scorched plague. You you fight scorched humans. You fight scorched beasts. You animals that are scorched the scorched beast queen like you deal with all of this this is kind of the main original storyline of the game and to think that they lived for a number of years without the scorch plague almost 10 years this is nine years later without the scorch plague right. and then all of a sudden you know and things were going pretty well and then all of a sudden this happens and and that's even more phenomenal to think about it yet in this situation because there are still raiders there are still super mutants there are still mutants in the wasteland terrorizing things there's still a lot of dangers there's uh, these groups are working together but they're not necessarily united and they're basically holding their own they're creating environments for people to kind of live and start putting their lives back together nine years after the great war and that's an accomplishment because we know how most of the world of fallout goes like things just don't seem to get better 200 years later things are still not good and people are still just trying to eke out a meager meager existence and they were doing pretty all right for themselves and then the scorch beast plague happens and that's yeah. just i mean it's, it's very unfortunate but of course it's a you know in a very interesting way to write this in and if you don't know the history of it then all you think is oh these scorch beasts have been here since the the bombs dropped they they, they hadn't actually um you know different things happen at different times the radiation yeah they're not a result <laughs> of the bombs and the radiation so um so that's a wonderful place to go into the middle of the show why don't why don't we do that hello there old chap good to see another of general atomics finest still eager to serve so Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our patrons. You guys are 
our absolute favorite people in in the entire universe. You guys are amazing. Thank you for supporting the show. We have three of our tier five patrons that I need to call out and say very special thanks to because at tier five and tier six, you get called out on every episode of the show. So Amelia R, Justin S and Matt B. Thank you very much. Genuinely from the bottoms and the tops of our hearts from our completed completed heart shaped mass in the middles of our chests that move blood around. Thank you for supporting us and for everyone else who is supporting us. Thank you for that. If you are interested in helping to make sure that we can keep doing this show and bringing you this kind of content, then please check out patreon.com slash fall lorecast where you can find that, you know, if you even sign up on the first tier, you get ad free episodes. And then if you sign up for other tiers, you get other stuff like discounts from the store, the extended versions of the episodes that, you know, after we ended the normal episode, we'll continue talking with chat and stuff like that. There's all sorts of fun stuff you can get there, along with the ability to join us at the end of every month and join our patron chat, which is always a wonderful time and such a good group of people. Um, so go check that out. There's lots of good stuff. Also, Lainey, we're, we're like hanging out in the upper 400s per month at this point. We are very, 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 very close to getting to 500. And we've surpassed that like a month and then dropped back below. Surpassed it and then dropped back below. If we can get to 500 and stay there for two months, I'm going to say at least two months, then we've hit that goal for me, the requirement of 500 for a few few months, which means that I have to go out and get my fallout tattoo. And that was that was something I put on the Patreon back when I started it as kind of this like pie in the sky. Yeah, maybe someday we'll get to five hundred dollars. That'll never happen, but it'd be cool. You know, I can get a tattoo. I'll probably put something on my shoulder, maybe like the logo for the show or like a scorch beast or something or, you know, death claw. I don't know. We'll come up with it. You guys can help me decide what that is. But if we get there and we stay there for a few months, that's that's what I'm going to have to go get done. Um, so. If you want to help me out with that, go check out patreon.com slash fallorecast. And thank you again to all of our patrons. You guys are amazing. If you have any questions about Nuka World, I'd be delighted to answer them. So we are back and this is the second half of the show and the Scorch Beasts are back too, or at least here now. Maybe not back. They didn't really go anywhere initially. They're now here. (laughs) So what's the deal with the Scorch Plague and what's going on with the responders? So... Well, it came out of nowhere, and nobody knew what it was. At this point, they don't know it's a plague. There really is no information. There are scorched beasts, and now there are things that are turning up that are scorched. There are people that are scorched. There are creatures that are scorched. What are they? Who knows? Mm-hmm. And they're not just um, ghouls. I mean, they look kind of ghoulish, no, no. but they're, they're different. They're really, they think. They have their own kind of community. They... Oh, it, they're so strange. Yeah, it's, um, it's clearly something a, that's like affecting more than just level, humans. It's there's more going on. On a physical level, they are burning from the inside out, but that has that doesn't even touch the way it affects their minds. This is a whole other beast, <laughs> um, and it's a plague, so anyone can get it. Uh, yeah, we'll have to so, dig into this more in a future episode because this is a yeah. whole episode by itself for sure. Um, so in response, the responders, you know, that's, that's what they do. They respond to things. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, (laughs) they're not pre pre responders. They're responders. (laughs) They, well, they're not psychic. (laughs) (laughs) Um, They agreed a group called the fire breathers that are dedicated to training elite fighters in order to defend settlers from the scorched, as well as other wasteland fire breathers. It's such Um, a good name. It's super cool. They're military trained. These are members of the military that work for the responders that are training their elite fighters to get the scorched, which are, they don't even know what they are. They're just getting them. Um, they're doing their best. <laughs> it's the whole, that's the whole story is just like, and then they did their best yeah. and then they tried again and they did the best. <laughs> like, right. It's like, what are they even doing? Um, so the Brotherhood of Steel, I don't know if it's because maybe they had more insight onto what the enclave was doing. I don't know if it's just because they figured it out sooner, Um, but they attempt to warn uh, Maria Chavez of 
the scorched and how dangerous it actually is and the way that it might actually be affecting things. You know, nobody really knows what's going on or how to fix it. But the Brotherhood has some insight and tries to share it. Mm -hmm. And Maria decides that she wants none of it because she thinks that the Brotherhood is just like big old military. It's just going to go fight everything. It doesn't care about the people. And she cares about the people. She thinks that if she attacks us on her own, she'll come to a better conclusion. Right. So she's right. too stubborn to accept her advice and just totally disregards it. Um, which is and, which is which is very tragic because this is another place where the groups could have been working together. We did right. uh, this was one of the topics that I did an episode on months ago was the Brotherhood in Appalachia and Taggarty, Taggarty's Thunder, uh, the development of the Brotherhood, the support from Maxon. Um, there and there was a lot that they were already doing and accomplishing in the wasteland so their advice on this would have been very useful to have followed because mm -hmm. while the responders were responding to their needs in their part of appalachia and maintaining the livelihood of the people there the the brotherhood were a trained military force they were ex-military who were now restructured around this new ideology and had m many accomplished and been fighting a lot of these dangers before the responders even became aware of them. So uh, this was a, a bit troublesome, not only because they it was a dumb choice on her part, um, but also because at this point they're allies. And she decided that suddenly the responders just aren't listening anymore. And uh, it's unfortunate because their alliance had been very strong, right? They were all thriving mm -hmm. right before this happened. And it's almost like just like that, it just fizzled. It was just over because they stopped communicating, which is just, it's the worst. It, uh, anything would have been better. It's like, um, a, it's like a bad TV show where like the... <laughs> the protagonist just doesn't tell somebody else something and you're just like N just talk to them just right? communicate I, I hate when <laughs> that is like like the lack of communication is the reason for the uh for the uh i don't know in the, i don't know the, the ramp up to the climax of whatever the story happens to be like it's just like that's the easiest thing to solve just talk you know like right. it's better for there to be like some physical thing that keeps you apart okay that makes sense but like you just aren't telling them come on stop yeah yeah <laughs> um so so yeah so uh maria takes the responders on a different route she decides that they're going to do some of their own research try to get to the bottom of things so she decides to work with a local scientist amy carey and amy has um amy's not a part of the responders she in fact very distinctly chooses to work outside of them mm -hmm. um but she Decides to aid them. So uh, she's attempting to learn more about the Scorched, uh, what they are, what they're doing, and how to get rid of them, of course, right? And it's through research with her and some other scientists that they eventually do find out that it is a plague. <laughs> right. Um, right. And so this project with Amy is supposed to be a secret, except in 2095, somebody leaked it to the Brotherhood. Uh, who showed up with the responders, and at this point they are not friends, showed up, put the responders at gunpoint, and asked Maria what what she was working on. Mm -hmm. And, of course, because everyone is stubborn and dumb now, they just don't tell them. <laughs> stubborn and dumb now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... So that's just great. <laughs> yeah, but and, I mean that this this makes sense though. I mean this is this is what the Brotherhood does is they they see right. themselves as the like saviors of the wasteland, and there if there is technology or science, then they need to be the ones who are in control of it because they don't trust anyone else to be. Um, and we've seen we've seen how that becomes divisive in the wasteland in other Fallout stories. Like this is this is kind of a running theme. And when they're at their best, they tend to be more sharing and more considerate of other people. And of course, that does put them in their own, you know, danger sometimes. But when they're at their worst, they are, you know, completely isolationist and doubt anybody else even has the ability to do the right thing in the situation. And of course, that creates friction. So, yeah. So, of course, you know, Brotherhood shows up, puts them at gunpoint. They don't share anything. Um and this is also a tragic decision because the Brotherhood then uh, kind of pitters out 
they they fall to the wasteland and yeah, yeah they uh, it, go go listen to that episode you'll uh, we're, we won't go into it here but go listen to the episode it's uh, again another very tragic situation yeah so it's a uh, they're gone and the responders are really the only other group that's attempting to keep people safe in the wasteland and make it easier to adjust to the world like this and kind of get rid of the creatures that are around um so they're alone now and they do not have allies because they've cut everyone off um and between <laughs> between the scorch beast attacks that they're starting to get from the scorch beasts which are big old for anyone who hasn't played 76 can we describe the scorch beasts they're like sure dragons they're, uh, yeah, <laughs> they're dragons. They, I mean, they're basically they basically took the code for dragons from Skyrim and crammed it into Fallout. Is what they did. Yeah. Um, but it's I mean, they're giant bats. They're giant mutated bats. <laughs> is what they are, and they <laughs> they have this like sonar attack that they shoot at you. These big rings of like I don't know sound, but they're visualized, and um, they can swoop and poop at you. Is what I call it. They, yeah, yeah, they, they drop that, um, that, I don't know, that mist, like the radiated mist as they like come yeah, down and swoop on you. Uh, yeah, they're, they're big baddies. And until, yeah. until you reach high enough level, um, and you've kind of maxed out your character, you've got some good weapons, you've got some good armor and things. They're, they're a constant threat because, uh, um, especially in certain parts of the map, you're more likely to run into them and you'll hear them. You'll see them flying around in the distance and they'll they'll come down and fight with whoever's below them. They, they don't care. They just kind of they're like the dragons in Skyrim. Yeah. Swoop and poop. <laughs> That's what they do. Swooping and pooping. Yeah. All right. So I I have to keep dealing with sushi. I'm so sorry. It's OK. Um, it's worth it. So. So, OK, so uh, between the Scorch Beasts and the Raiders attacking various outposts, attacking the responders in general, both at their base and wherever else they've spread to. Because at this point, I mean, they were doing really well. They spread all over the place. Um, <laughs> things get really tough because there's no one else helping. They are the helpers. And when the helpers are the ones being attacked, what are they supposed to do? You know? Um, mm hmm. But they had a little bit of hope because they were still working on their science projects, right? They have a better idea of what the Scorched are at this point. They've seen the spread of things. Science projects. And They've got their trifold thing set up. The yeah, se somebody, yeah, has, somebody has they a little volcano the on, the, on the side. <laughs> and then somebody else is like, that's not even ex an experiment. It's just a project. Yeah. Some kid accidentally invents a time machine. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, science projects. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, they thought they could produce a cure for the Scorch Plague, which they might have been able to, right? Uh, in the game, you are able to inoculate people eventually in one, right. of, the, one had, of the quest lines. Had they been and, given a little bit more time and a little bit more support, they were very close. Right. Yeah. But because they didn't listen to the Brotherhood in the very beginning, they're too late. And so um, by the point that they, they would have gotten it through, not only... Um, were they being attacked so much from all of the things in the wasteland? Everything's out to fight you, including the people, right? It's a dangerous, dangerous world. Um, but also, it was interfering with their communication with other outposts. And so the research was, wasn't was only happening in one spot, right? They had people from the outside mm -hmm. helping. And they couldn't contact these people anymore because different outposts were going down. Um, and so... <laughs> they sent out the fire breathers in an attempt to kind of stop the scorch, kind of close them into different areas, you know, make it a little bit easier, buy a little bit more time to get this cure out, and all hell breaks loose. It was kind of a last, and, last ditch effort. Yeah. Yeah. And the fire breathers certainly were not enough. <laughs> um, and all of the responders died. Like that was that was it. Um which is, it's rough, but if you spend any amount of time in 76, you can see that truly, unless you're a, a beefcake, you're a beefcake, it's, you can't survive as a normal person in the wasteland. Like it just, it, it won't happen. Like Fabio? So. That's like an Fabio. old, that's an a old pole. Fabio was like <laughs> the guy that was on all the fronts of the romance novels back in like the 
90s. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't alive. <laughs> no, you weren't. Oops. Um, <laughs> I said oops as if it's as if I had a choice. Oops. oops. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so the squish to dangerous, the wasteland is dangerous, the responders could not handle it, and out they went. Um, mm-hmm. But that's so, not the end of the story. No. Yeah. Um, there's a little bit more. I mean, so all of their stuff is... Well, not all of it, obviously. We had a flood <laughs> from the dam, and we had whatever else has happened since then. Sure. Um, but a lot of things are left behind, and if you play the game, you can go and see them, and you can go through the automated training you can become a volunteer um and you can learn more about the scorched and things like that but uh it appears that not all is lost and that you as a player character may not be the only one kind of looking into all of this Mm -hmm. so in 2102 um is what that's the year the responders 100 percent they were gone but in 2103 uh, a settler named Heather Ellis. Well, I think uh, 20, across- 2102 is when you leave the vault. They've they've already been gone by then. Oh, okay. So by then they had been completely eradicated. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. By 2102. Right. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't it's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> so a year a year later. So year and this later. this coincides with um, Wastelanders coming out, which which every year in the real world is actually a year in the game as well. So mm-hmm. the the game launched. It was twenty one oh two. The your player character leaves Vault seventy six. A year goes by. The events of Wastelanders happens, and um, people start moving back to Appalachia, and that's when the settler shows up, Heather Ellis. Right, um, and she comes across, I think, in the Flatwoods. What's left of the responders? Mm-hmm. And- Right, it's in the yep. Flatwoods. I'm yeah. to think of playing the game. Yep. Um, yep. And you can and meet her if you if you go do this now. If you're a new player and you go to Flatwoods and you find uh, that that responders location that was in Flatwoods is actually in an old church, you will run across Heather, Heather Ellis, uh, who is there. Does she have a dog? Yeah, she has a dog too. She's got a she's a, a good a good good boy. She's got a good boy. Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> um. And so yes, yeah, so you can also go through the automated training right and so heather does this as well and by the time that you meet her i think she's stuck on the path to become a fire breather Mm -hmm. which you can also do in the game which is fun anyone who hasn't played this yet i think i said this last time too but like it's it's really fun to get to go through all these stories um i saw a meme today about (laughs) about fault 76 um it was like someone laughing at all the uh walking simulator games on the playstation store and then mm-hmm. like realizing that fall 76 was a walking simulator <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's not it's not but yeah I, not, I guess you could not, play it really like funny. that yeah right <laughs> i mean it, by that logic any any rpg is a walking simulator well, yeah. <laughs> you just walk from one mission to the next <laughs> Yeah, definitely uh, much more so original launch Fallout 76. Yeah, but even yeah. then, you're still finding things. It was never a walking simulator, right, but right, it's pretty funny. Right. So, um, so let's let's get back to this concept because I, I think there's some really interesting stuff here. We have we have a group. Uh, let me sum this up. Right. We have a group of people who started out as first responders who rise to the occasion and heroically do a lot of things right even though they make some bad decisions along the way they do a lot of things right and even in the end they give their lives in order to defend the ability to do the research to try to solve this plague and they make a lot of good decisions they they organize they create a structure they train people they have a a actual unified response. They try to make things work out among different groups in the wasteland. They devote attention to science where it's needed. They use the skills of the people who are in the group and the the education and the talents of the people in the group in order to try to do what they do best in order to make this all work out. And in the end, they all give their lives in order to see if they can save everyone. And they can't. And we're left by 2103 with just the remnants of what they had created, but also kind of a playbook for what they did, what they succeeded at, how to finish the cure, and also how to learn from the things that they did wrong. 
And here we have a single settler, Heather Ellis, who discovers this along with you and is now committed to forming the new responders, to following in that path. And it makes me wonder if there's a future for this. Is this a story that will continue to develop as new uh, DLC comes out for the game, as new stories come out for the game? We're at a point now in the game where we have Wastelanders. We have the Raider group and we have the Settler group. We have the Brotherhood of Steel showing back up. We might have, there's rumor that maybe we're going to get more Enclave stuff coming. And I've speculated about that on the Fallout Hub show with Ken and Dave. And uh, that, by the way, that most recent episode will come out very, very soon. We took kind of a break over the holidays, but that's coming back. So go look up the Fallout Hub if you want more Fallout 76 stuff. Um, but this could be the beginning of the new responders. What if after this next expansion comes out, we find that she has now rebuilt parts of the responders and has started recruiting again or is is working, has followed the path and is now working and communicating with the Brotherhood of Steel? or becomes part of the brotherhood. Like this could go many different directions. I think that this is cool because there are groups in the wasteland who are generally, generally not just for themselves. And I think the responders are the epitome of that. They are doing what they can for the betterment of humanity as a whole with very little thought for themselves first. And that is heroic and it is noble. And it's unfortunate that things didn't work out for them. But like I said, it does kind of create a template for what that could be in the future. And in the Fallout universe, that's kind of a rare thing, right? Like so many of the groups in the wastelands, the wastelands, the different places that we've been in the different games are mostly out for themselves. Even the NCR has a lot of their own concerns at hand and feel overwhelmed at times dealing with all the other issues. And the, the and the responders are, aren't any different in feeling over, overwhelmed by all these issues, but they were first and foremost responders. They were first and foremost paramedics and medical people and police officers and firefighters who have been trained to try to put other people's needs first. And I think that that is a, a really interesting and different kind of perspective than we get in many of the other Fallout games. So it's actually very, very cool. Yeah, <laughs> Reagan, Reagan, Legan, Reagan, Legan, I hope I say Legan right, like you, like you would want me to uh, read that. 21 in chat says, the responders are what the Brotherhood thinks they are. Potentially, yeah. Uh, it's, you know, the, the Brotherhood could learn a lot from them, they could learn a lot from the Brotherhood when it comes to organization and structure. Um, <laughs> they could have. <laughs> yeah, they could have. They could have. But we're, <laughs> we're getting new, new people coming back to the, to the wasteland. So I, I think we're going to see more developments of things. I think the stories are going to continue. And I'm excited to see where it goes. So Lainey's just nodding her head. She's like, yep, yep. I agree. <laughs> you said lots of words and I have nothing else to say because you already used them all up. <laughs> <laughs> you just pull up. What do I do now? What do I do now? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so exciting stuff. So I guess that wraps up our responder section. Thank you for putting that together, Lainey. And yeah, um, the uh, the big news around the world of Fallout 76 right now is that the PTS has the recent updates on it. So you should go check that out if you're interested in downloading the PTS, the the, the test server, in order to see the changes to. Uh, there's a lot of UI changes, especially for the Pip Boy and um, quality of life improvements for the game. And there was just an announcement today I saw on Twitter that I believe they're they're planning to push those all out to the to the actual game on the 26th of this month. January so very very soon just a few weeks away we should have those improvements which I'm excited about and and uh, they teased that that's just the beginning there's a bunch more so awesome awesome keep working on those improvements keep working on story keep working on stuff the game has been developing very very well uh, I just it still crashes for me when I stream it sometimes so please don't crash it but then again maybe that's OBS I don't know it could be OBS's fault for all I know so I don't know. But uh, I'm excited for where it's going. Lainey, do you have anything to talk about or share before we head out? I've been, I mean, I've been streaming. Um, I'm always streaming, though. <laughs> so that's not new. Uh, I did mention last time, but it was after we had finished that part of what I'm doing in my stream, an extra project that we've added on, is that my roommate Corey and I are starting a YouTube channel. So on my stream, we stream games together that maybe have been... Um, a common theme is that there are at least games that one of us hasn't played before. 
if not both, mm-hmm. uh, and probably are known for issues they've had with either uh, not being too polished or leaning too heavily into tropes, <laughs> games, <laughs> things like this. Games with problems. Um, <laughs> games with problems. Basically your and, stream. <laughs> and what we're doing with them is we're playing them together all the way through and then getting to the end and making a video essay about uh, what they did and what they could have done better. Mm-hmm. Um what's my channel name and what do i do i okay Neos so Pandora. my Neos Neos Pandora. Pandora. Yep. yeah yep. um there it is and i do lots of things i stream what all do i stream you stream fallout says, you stream I, yeah. uh so you, you stream some mainline games right like you stream out you stream fallout right, so i do i do fallout i do elder scrolls i do um dark souls i do um what else other ones, those are like the big three. Right. I do those you, the most. You change it up um, like almost every day. Yeah. So I, I stream almost daily and I do a little bit of everything. I explore indie games. So we just did one. Uh, we started one called Stealth Inc., which is fun. Uh, it's a little puzzle game. And then we do other ones too. I've I played some Apex Legends if you're into like FPS games. <laughs> Shooting fools. I do fools, a little bit of anything. Taking names. Shooting fools. Yeah. I, I always name those. Um, what is it when you flip when you flip them? Uh, when you flip them? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Taking names and taking ass. Oh, oh, wait! You flip the words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. I usually name those names. I got gotcha. you. I've been I've um, been influenced. I'm, I'm now saying fools because of uh, this mechan. Oh, then we should talk about this. The mechanist. Have you seen this on on Twitter? There's yeah. an account uh, for yeah for the mechanist, which I should do an episode on. Uh, that that would be a fun episode. <laughs> Although we we're doing seventy six stuff. Me- the, okay, so if anybody doesn't know, the mechanist is one of the characters that shows up in Fallout and Fallout Three and Fallout Four, and people dress up as him because he's one of the superhero slash villains. I don't know which he is all the time. It seems to be a little bit of both. Um, there was an expansion called Automaton for Fallout Fallout 4, which is based around building robots and stuff, and the antagonist for that one is the the mechanist, or a person dressed up as the mechanist. And um, somebody's created a Twitter account where they've uh, started role-playing as him, I guess. Uh, Nobody seems to know who this is, but they're now challenging... they're, They're doing ridiculous things, like these voice clips where they're talking about saving the wasteland and yelling at their robots and then more recently have been challenging basically everybody and everybody to rap duels which is absolutely hilarious so if you haven't checked this out go check it out i've I've shared some of the stuff on my account but this is one of the best things i've seen in the fallout community twitter in in a while it's now funny. it's pretty great <laughs> uh other things of note um Ken from Chat of Fallout 76 podcast has built a Bioshock building, a Bioshock camp, um, and it looks really, really cool. You should go check that out. He's got pictures. Um, so if you're not following Chat of Fallout 76 podcast Twitter as well, go check that out. It, it looks really, really cool. I wonder if there's anything else going on in the community. Um, this community is awesome. You guys are you guys are great. Um, I just awesome. I love all the stuff you guys share and all the all the fun things. So go check that stuff out. It's it's hilarious. Um, all right. I think that's it. What do I have going on? I've got my regular streams. I have been streaming. I'm committing now to streaming every day during the day. So generally in the late morning, sometime after about 1030, I will be streaming live while I work and edit podcasts and do all sorts of things. And I would love for you guys to come by and be like my work friends who can just kind of hang out and chat with me while I'm at work. It's awesome. It's awesome. We've been having a lot of fun. A lot of people in chat right now have have come by during the day Uh, and it it's great. You know, it gives me somebody to talk to and and we have a good time and they can ask questions or we just talk about whatever. And then after I get done with my work, usually I'll stream a game in the afternoons and again, lots of fun, good times and uh, thank you, those of you who have been joining me. I really do appreciate hanging out with you guys. You guys are awesome. I need to come hang out with you guys. Yeah, yeah, you should come by or yeah. go hang out. They should go check you out if you're streaming during the day. I so. guess, yeah. <laughs> yep. Sometimes I'm live while you're live. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes we're live at the same time. Yeah. Then you have to. Then we have to fight. It's a battle. We should have a rap battle. Really Can you rap between our channels? Can you rap? Because I've rap? I've never rapped. Can you I... rap? We could. We could try to have a rap battle. I can like. <laughs> okay okay can i can we do wait wait maybe we should instead of rap because we're not rappers maybe we should do a poem battle maybe we should do a haiku battle a, po- a 
haiku battle? Yeah, haiku battle. What is this? Where a you, hobbit? A hot what? No, a haiku. You, you do a haiku. You make a haiku. No, and I, you send it to the other person. And oh no, a hobbit. What? I said, what is this? The Hobbit? You oh, know, oh, because uh, of the because of the riddles, the riddle battle. They, no, riddles. no, yeah. it's not a riddle battle. It's a haiku battle. But it has to be like a rap battle where you have to like put the other person down and talk about how awesome you are, but only in the span of a haiku. Oh man, I could do it. I could do it. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to see. All right. Well, I, th I think that's it for this episode of the show. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We will be hanging out uh, to chat with you guys for a bit after the show. And if you're interested in getting uh, that, then make sure you subscribe on the Patreon. And Lainey's holding up her little vault guy. Thumbs up. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Talk to you later. plug into everything else we're doing, check out robotsradio.net. Also, look up the Robots Radio YouTube for videos about Fallout and other things. And check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash robotsradio. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.